This morning's text for our sermon comes from Matthew's Gospel. I'll be reading from the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 13 through verse 16. Would you bow your heads as we pray for illumination? O oh God, we come as people who are hungry for the word of life. And so as these words of scripture are read, enliven them with your Holy Spirit, that they may become the very word of God that speaks and transforms our life. For this we offer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is in Galilee. He is preaching what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And we hear these words of Jesus to his disciples, and he says, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how will it become salty again? It is good for nothing except to be thrown away and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on top of a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on top of a lampstand and it shines on all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so that they can see the good things that you do and praise your Father who is in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, this past New Year's, Letitia and I cooked what is a traditional New Year's Day meal. It was consistent of a ham and cabbage and black-eyed peas and my special cornbread recipe. It was some good eating, let me tell you. Uh, how many of y'all cooked that kind of meal on New Year's Day? Yeah, quite a, quite a few of us. Uh, the rest of you are probably Yankees, that's all I got to say. <laughs> and who of us would not want a little more good luck and a little more cash in our pockets for 2017? Now, whether you believe that uh, folklore or not, uh, personally, I don't really believe that, but I eat it anyway just to, you know, couch things. Uh, if, if, you, um, if you eat that meal, you know um, that it takes just a little bit of preparation. Well, after everything was uh, cooked, we, uh, we set the food on the table. Uh, we sat down, uh, we lit our Christ candle, and we said those holy words, Jesus is the light of the world, and we invited him to be our guest at our table. And then we joined hands, and we offered a prayer of thanksgiving, uh, thanking God for the blessings he has given to us uh, in our life and for this food. And so then uh, we dug in. Uh, that's where everything gets quiet. <laughs> and I cut up the ham, and I cut up the cabbage, and, and I began to eat. And when I got to the black-eyed peas, something wasn't quite right. They were bland, bland, bland. And, and even though we had, you know, we had put in uh, bacon, the one ingredient that we forgot was salt. We had not salted the water. How many of y'all have done that before? Okay, the rest of you are liars. That's just all I have to say. And it was one of those situations in which uh, he said that she had salted the water and she said, well, I thought you had salted the water, but it turned out that nobody had salted the water. And even though they looked the same and they were tender, uh, they were very different, very different. Now, the truth of the matter is salt is a flavor enhancer, and salt 
um, brings out the flavors of food uh, that we probably would not eat otherwise. If you've ever tried to re uh, eat a baked potato with salt, without salt, or rice, or even black-eyed peas, you, you know, you just almost can't do it. And salt is in almost all of our food, and you can find it as a staple ingredient in every kitchen, in every nation around this world. Salt adds flavor, and it also adds life. It is necessary for the proper functioning of our bodies. But what if salt loses its saltiness? What good is it? We would take it and throw it in the trash, wouldn't we? And what if it was worse, salt made your food taste like dirt? We would get rid of it because it would be good for nothing. Or what if, after having lit our Christ candle and declare Jesus to be the light of the world and invite him to our table, what would we do if we put a basket over that light so as to hide the light and the presence of Christ among us? Jesus uses these two metaphors of salt and light to talk about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, to be that which is enhancing the world with life, and to be light bearers that draw all other people unto him. In John's gospel, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then later on, in the first letter of John, we read, in him there is no darkness at all. You see, when the moment of creation, God spoke the word light, and the light shattered the darkness, and God sent his son, Jesus, to be born of Mary, born of the people of Israel, born in a specific time and place, that he might be the light that shatters the darkness of our hearts. Those who have known him have that light living in themselves. And this is why Jesus says to his disciples and to us, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Now, I can imagine that, you know, his uh, 12 disciples are gathered around him, and when Jesus says, you are the light of the world, that they quickly glance over their shoulder. Really? You talking to me? Light of the world? You see, the disciples knew that their lives that they live their lives no differently after they'd come to Jesus than before. There was still darkness within them. There was still sin that hindered the light of Christ from shining in the world. They were not perfect, and they knew that better than anyone else. Now, we who claim to be disciples of Jesus, who have received by his grace him into our lives, who know the difference, the life-giving presence that he gives to us, we also know that we are not perfect and that there is still sin and darkness within us. You see, far too many Christians today, I think, they cover up that light. They, they live one day, uh, way on Sundays, but on Monday through Saturday, they live in an entirely different manner. We choose to walk in darkness instead of 
the light of Christ which reveals the kind of lives we really live. It is not uncommon in the church for those of us to bemoan the fact that our children and our grandchildren are not here. In fact, we know that 20-somethings and early 30-somethings, that generation that we call the millennials, are leaving the church in droves. And if you were to ask them, they would tell you why. Kenda Creasy Dean, who is an ordained United Methodist elder, and she is also a professor of youth, church, and culture at Princeton University. She wrote in her book, Almost Christians, what the faith of our teenagers is saying to the Christian church of America, that these young people see no difference between the way that Christians live their lives and those who claim no faith at all. In fact, they will point to the fact that non-Christians oftentimes live a more godlike life than those who profess Jesus as Lord. A recent Pew uh, research study showed that 80% of millennials have either dropped out of church or they have never been to church at all and they have no interest in going to church. And they often cite these reasons that the church is, is seen as being exclusive. It is one of the most segregated times of the week that we are judgmental, that we are hypocritical, moralistic, anti-scientific, inauthentic, and generally out of touch with the culture. But yet, they view Jesus positively because they can see in his life that he was loving and kind and compassionate and non-judgmental, forgiving, that in him he lived a truly authentic human existence. Now I have to tell you, that sounds like good news. It sounds like good news, doesn't it? What does it mean to be salty and to be a life-bearing Christian? What does that look like? I would think that it probably looks something like Jesus. It would look something like compassion and love and forgiveness of not judging others, of being a voice for the voiceless, for those who are on the fringes of society, the poor, the abused, those who are excluded. We are to be that light that speaks up on behalf of the little ones if we are to be any kind of witness whatsoever in this world. Now here's the thing. It doesn't take much light to dispel the darkness. Scientists have proven that the light of one candle, think about that, one candle can be seen by the human eye 1.7 miles away. And I find that incredible that the smallest light can break the darkness. The people who walked in darkness, though, have seen a great light. And we know that light to be Jesus. Jesus said, don't hide your light under a bushel basket, 
but rather put it out on a lampstand so that all may see it and give praise not to you, not to me, but to our heavenly Father. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. And we don't have to wait until we die till that becomes a reality in our life. Jesus says in the present tense, you are right now salt. You are right now light. Now we aren't perfect. We're going to mess up. We're going to sometimes hide our light under a basket, under a covering of darkness. And yet, this is what we're called to do, to let the light of Christ in us shine forth. Friends, we are coming this morning to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We come to a table where no one is excluded. A table in which Jesus is our host and we are his guest. And at this table, we receive salt and light, bread and wine, body and blood. We take Christ into our lives and he so fills our lives with his grace that we are truly a different people. He has not withheld anything from us. He has given it his all. And nothing in life or in death, not sin, not doubt, not even choosing darkness, can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so I invite you to come. Come to this table and receive the embrace of God. Come to this table and receive his life-giving body and blood that will strengthen you and encourage you for your walk with him. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Thanks be to God. Amen.